Hello, welcome back uh, to the run-up. Well, we're talking about the candidates for Saturday's election and especially their manifestos that they have presented to the people of Nigeria. We are being joined by Mr. Biodun Shomi, a public affairs analyst. Welcome to the program, Mr. Shomi. We also have Mr. Shegun Shokweton, Chairman, Accountability, Candor, and Transparency Network. Welcome to the program, Mr. Shokweton. Thank you for having me. Good morning, everyone. And then we have a political scientist in the house as well, Mr. Omoshola Deji. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you for bringing me up. Okay. Uh, well, as a person, I am more concerned about the fact that we've been having manifestos all these years and they don't seem to be followed uh, to the letter. And that is my greatest concern right now. But for now, uh, let's just get to look at the manifestos so far presented by the candidates without having a particular candidate in mind now. But we've heard the manifestos, of especially the three or four leading candidates, because everybody wants to identify uh, three or four leading candidates. But there are other candidates. Uh, we have 18, so the other 15 candidates all have given manifestos. But so far, um, how do you rate, how do you assess the manifestos that have been given by these uh, candidates and how you think this can translate into a better Nigeria tomorrow. Let me begin uh, with my, Mr. Showomi. Yes, uh, manifesto, the just um, statement of promises, you know, intentions, statements of intent um, on what you intend to do when you get to power. It's a different thing when people get elected and then get into office, other variables come in, other subjective factors, even objective factors can come in and derail, you know, the manifesto from being implemented. Um, again, you also have people presenting manifesto under the guise of believing that that's what the public wants to hear, and if that is what the voters want to hear, um, they would rather say that without any intention to implement it or any capacity you know, to deliver on those promises uh, made in the manifesto. This is a pattern globally. It's not peculiar to Nigeria, uh, where manifestos are not adhered to strictly or are even abandoned in some cases. Um, these are facts and realities. In relation to our current um, presidential elections, the 2023 elections, um, we have had many beautiful uh, manifestos. All, all, virtually all the aspirants you know, came out with their own idea of how they intend you know, to deal with the problem. You have a, um, one uh, coming out with, uh, for instance, you have um, a article coming out with a purely capitalist-oriented um, uh, manifesto, you know, based on the regulation of the commanding heights of the economy. You have a Tinubu coming out, you know, with a, a liberal um, a market perspective in his uh, manifesto. And you have a BOB coming out with a clearly entrepreneurial, uh, private sector-led manifesto. In all the three leading candidates, um, in my view, they are the three most leading. Uh, you also have Kwakwanzo, he has his own manifesto too which I have issues with. Um, they all have brilliant points. They have their strengths, and they also have their weaknesses. The problem is not the manifesto. The devil is in Asso Rock. It's when you get into Asso Rock, other variables come into it. How do you tend, how do you end up implementing them? For instance, um, all the aspirants did talk about uh, restructuring in one way or the other. All of them actually touched on it. Uh, but when it comes to the black tax, I, um, you may now need to consider who is better placed to restructure the country um, than the other. Uh, they call it different things. Um, in the case of uh, Matiku, it was actually clear, restructuring. We spoke about the same thing. I think Tinubu called his own reform 
and regionalization, which is basically about restructuring the country. And um, also did the same thing, and even went as far as mentioned some specifics. So broadly, the problem is the whole of good manifesto is a subjective evaluation to determine which one is better or not. So it's always variable. It depends on who you talk to and what are the factors and the parameters being considered. But they all have good manifesto. The reality now is, are they all able to deliver on the manifesto? Do they have the strong will, the character, you know, the political will, um, the character? Will they have the backings in the National Assembly to ensure, for instance, that they're able to roll the um, uh, restructuring agenda uh, through. Because if you don't have the figures in the National Assembly and you don't have a bipartisan agreement, you may not be able to execute it. And that is exactly what I mean by the reality, you know, comes in after people get elected. Uh, there are other variables, other factors that will come into play. You, you have the issue of the negotiations to ensure that all interests are well protected and uh, this could take some time. So I think likely Nigerians need to focus more on capacity to deliver, on experience, on track record, and uh, on also uh, political will, courage in leadership, audacity of courage, audacity to give hope to our people. And that is what matters. In terms of implementation of manifesto in Nigeria, we always have a problem with that because you never have a party having to talk of um, the um, House of Reps and the Senate at any point in time. So you find yourself having to negotiate with those who are probably opposed to, probably opposed to what they are trying to do or to your party's agenda. And that is always a problem. Till today, we have never been able to modify or amend our constitution uh, you know, significantly, uh, simply because of this problem, because you have to have to talk in the National Assembly and you must have to talk in the state's houses of assembly. So the, the, these are the practical reality between, you know, promise and reality. So all those who spoke about, we will do the structure, we will do this, we will do that. Everything depends on the numbers in the National Assembly. So at the end of the day, you may have it happening or it may not even happen, depending on who will who wins the presidential election and the composition of the National Assembly. Okay, uh, well, when Mr. Shomi was talking, uh, Mr. Shokotan, I'm coming to you. I remembered uh, a novel that uh, the past president of, the erstwhile president of America wrote, The Audacity of Hope, and a very inspiring novel. I have that, and I, I really loved it. Uh, but right now, let me just, we've listened to the um, manifestos, we've read them, uh, especially the, the ones that we felt um, we should pay close attention to. Are there some things that you would rather have in the manifestos that, uh, that seem to either be missing or uh, they were not given the kind of prominence that they needed to have, been, to have given in these manifestos? Mr. Shopperton, do you have any any item that you would have loved to be in these manifestos or given more prominence than it was given? Well, uh, thank you. Um, so, for, for me, you know, to say first of all that I agree with everything that Mr. Shaw said, um, in addition to that, I, I, think it's, um, I think it's very, very important to understand, for, for Nigerians to understand that uh, the manifesto of, of any political party and thereby their candidates is supposed to be the, the contractual document between that candidate and his party or her party and the citizen with. Um, and being a contractual document therefore means that it becomes um, you know, the reference point uh, to, to measure performance by. This is what should be the standard. Um, unfortunately, um, I, that, that has not been our experience. Uh, our experience is, has been that the manifesto is regarded as um, uh, uh, just a rite of passage, if you like, or um, fulfilling righteousness, just another uh, ritual to perform. 
in the electioneering process. You know, you have to have a manifesto, and everybody knows this, so everybody does one. I don't think that any of the parties have done these manifestos with a clear um, and very deliberate um, uh, objective of being held accountable to the content of those documents. Um, so when you say what what is what maybe what's missing in, in those manifestos that I would have loved to see, I think in terms of specific policy um, areas, areas of focus, I think you know all of the manifestos have been really very similar. Uh, you know, approaching the governance issue from different angles and from different areas of focus, perhaps, but they all addressed the key um, issues that Nigeria is contending with, whether you're talking about um, infrastructure deficits, whether you're talking about, you know, the governance, the atmosphere for rule of law, and all of that. What I think is missing, and I, I think we need to really, really begin to look into this and see how we can do this. What I think is missing is an action plan, an implement, if you like, an implementation timetable to say that, okay, you've done all of this, you put in you know, your ideas in terms of social infrastructure, you put in your ideas in terms of um, restructuring of the country, you lay down your ideas in terms of power um, and, you know, um, and other uh, hard infrastructure like that, you lay down your ideas in terms of the economy, agriculture, and so on and so forth, education, the health sector. In each one of those areas, is it possible or is it impossible? Is it that it is impossible for each of the candidates to put timelines and implementation plans? They don't have to be um, very exhaustive and long uh, project implementation uh, 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 timetables, for example. But is it not possible or is it impossible to say, for example, know that you've got a four year term and in those four years, this, this, this is what I will achieve in this area within this time frame. That is very, very missing in all of these documents. And, and you know, once you take that out of those documents, then you find that what those documents represent are just, they're just, they're just pieces of paper. It becomes very difficult for you to hold anybody, uh, you know, to the things that are in those documents because they have not been specific. You know, so if, if I decide that I want to take somebody on, for example, on the issue of restructuring, they can say, look, I've done my bit. I tried all that I could. You know, and that and that will be the end of the conversation. So if, for example, I want to hold the APC government, the current incumbent APC government, on the issue of restructuring, remembering that they were very, very, very elaborate in speaking to that issue mm -hmm. in the manifesto they released in 2014, leading up to the 2015 elections, you know, it's possible for them to say we did our best. You know, for example, there has been some level of devolution of powers. Um, you know, from the constitution that we had before, uh, coming down to the constitution that is the, the current review that is going on. They could argue that there has been some devolution. They could argue, uh, for example, that um, the president has, via some presidential orders, um, addressed the issue of restructuring to some degree. But you see, if there had been very specific promises with very specific timelines, with very specific implementation plans, then all I have to do is whip up that document and begin to tick it up. To say, look, this one you said you're going to do it within this time frame, you have not done it, therefore you are failed. And on the basis of that, then for the next elections, it's very easy for Nigerians to say, look, you've performed and this is your scorecard, or you didn't perform, you know, and this is why we say so. So for me, that that would be a very, very um, significant missing element in all of the manifestation. And I think that all the political parties are guilty of this. Um, of course. In addition to that, or aside from that, you, the, the will and the character to implement the manifestos is a completely different question. And one of the candidates have been, you know, harping on this and saying, look, everybody has a good manifesto, but who is going, who has the intention and the integrity, proven integrity, a proven track record of fulfilling their promises in the public space to go ahead and implement those manifestos? So that is a different conversation. But I think that it would be very beneficial to Nigeria and to Nigerians and to the electoral process if our manifestos can become a bit more measurable as this truism goes in business. What you do not measure, you cannot improve. So there, there, are, no, there are no frameworks for measurement of these promises in, in all of the manifestos. Okay. Uh, well, very important timelines, time frame uh, with which they want to implement these things. Maybe 
first 100 days, like all of them want to celebrate, first 100 days I'm going to do X, Y, Z. That's a very good point, Mr. Shokwetan, that you brought. Okay. Uh, well, uh, just briefly before we take a break, uh, let's uh, go to Shola. What are your thoughts generally? Just very briefly uh, so that we can take a break and return. Well, my thought as regards the campaign so far is that the, the uh, manifesto has shown that the candidate knows what the material problem is, especially as regards the basic. So the manifesto has likely covered a repetition of what we've heard over the years. We we'll provide this, we we'll do that, we we'll pay salary on time, we we'll draws, we we'll cover in security. So it has likely been a repetition of the challenges that past government has promised to eradicate, but still subsist. So they are kind of recording it. But what I think should have stand out is for the candidates to now say how they are going to achieve what they've said. If a candidate stands on the podium and says, I am going to end insecurity, we've heard that a number of times. We should be able to kind of like give us a little bit of the background of how you intend to at least tackle it, that will make us to um, select whoever we think is right. Because all of them are basically saying the same thing, but their um, strategy, not in details, could at least stand them out. For example, if you say you want to turn Nigeria from consumption to production and economy, how do you intend to do that? We don't have um, electricity, we don't have some key infrastructures that are determinant to the success of that. How do you intend to achieve that. And yeah, if you say you, you want to make the economic viable, you want to provide infrastructure, how do you intend to do that based on our dwindling resources where we are using majority of our finance to service debt? These are crucial things that the candidates should have addressed. It's easy for any candidate to come on board and promise everyone on earth. But how do we intend to achieve those things you are promising and we balancing it with the resources that is on ground and your, your track record and capacity as a person. They are kind of like two different things. So the manifesto is, has been largely addressing the, the basics and the repetition of what we've heard. It's just like more of a um, copy and paste kind of thing from past administration now. For example, the um, renewal of the APC is more like you know, um, a plagiarized one of the um, 1992 of MKO, Abiola. The Peter Obi consumption for production is it, um, appears to be in big times. There's no proper kind of like um, strategy of how we intend to achieve that based on the reality of what we have in the country right now. Um, Mr. Tiko Abubakar has been preaching unity, but um, at the same time, he hasn't given us our intent to form about that. And if what we are seeing in his party now is anything to go by, that contradicts what he is saying in terms of going not allowed to unify the country, but he hasn't able to unify his own party. So they have largely come up with the basics, but what will make them to achieve it, and now they intend to achieve, which is the most crucial thing, is, um, is missing in the whole manifesto itself. So for me, it makes it kind of like uninteresting, uninspiring, because we've not gotten any new thing, so to say. What would have been the new thing, since it has been a repetition for what we had in the past, is for them to tell us how they will be able to get the ground running, how they will be able to achieve it in terms of infrastructure, manpower, you know, foreign policy, a whole lot of things. For them to move away from all these places, we provide the city, we provide the, Some even go to the podium and they don't say any of these things. They'll be like, vote for, vote for us, you know, will you vote for us? And I, I've watched a series of campaign. There's even nothing like manifest today. They just sing, dance, and everybody goes home. For me, that's based on the volatile situation of the country now. That won't lead us to nowhere at the end of the day. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Shola. We'll take a short break, and when we return, we'll go into specifics. And especially, like I said at the beginning, I'm concerned about why it is not, uh, they seem to always get away with it. 
they promise one thing and they are not able to do it. Maybe there need to be one proactive measure or the other from the citizenry, I do not know. When we return, gentlemen, we'll deal with some issues. Stay with us. You're welcome back. It's still the run-up. And we're looking today at the presidential candidates and their manifestos. It's funny, anyway, that uh, we seem to lose track of the fact that this election will be national election, like there will be presidential election and there will be national assembly election, which means we'll be electing the senators and the members of the House of Representatives. And nobody's talking about the senators and House, members of the House of Representatives, even though they are the people who are closest to us, whose uh, constituency offices we can access and who we can take our complaints to, even though that is a debatable issue, whether they are close enough to us or not. But at least these are the people that are from the grassroots. But we don't seem to be talking about them. Maybe we'll talk about them tomorrow and see what we can say. Or maybe it's because uh, it's too wide. Everybody in what state can you be talking about at the same time? But today we're dealing with the presidential candidates and their manifestos and all the issues around that. We have Mr. Biodun Shoumi, a public affairs analyst here. We also have Mr. Shegun Shokweton, Chairman Accountability, Candor and Transparency Network, and Omar Shalat Deji, political scientist. Gentlemen, we're back here again. Um, Mr. Shoumi, let me come back to you. When you were talking with, you were talking uh, about a particular you use the word devil in Asurok, and we just, we just wonder, because this administration, for instance, could have had it all, because they have a loyal, uh, if you ask me, they have a loyal National Assembly, the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, they were loyal to the presidency. But it seems as if Nigerians still have cause to complain that everything, all the pillars that they rode on to power were maybe not fulfilled the way we should have seen them fulfilled. For instance, they talked about security. Is it better now? They talked about uh, corruption. Is it better now? And you pointed out also they talked about um, uh, restructuring. Uh, did they do anything about it? And so many other things that were promised. What do you think really constitutes this devil in our Surak? What are the issues like, that you said it is when they get there that they find out that it's almost impossible. What do you think are these things that make it so difficult for anybody with even the best of intentions to fulfill their promises uh, that they made in that social contract they had with the people in the name of Manifesto? Yes, um, <clears throat> Asurok is a sprawling complex and the seat of um, the president of the country. If you go into history, uh, recent history, you will realize that virtually everyone that enters that soul, you know, had genuine plans and they were usually perceived as um, uh, good people before going into us work. But by the time they leave us work, you end up, you know, with a different personality, somebody who probably uh, you will think uh, that was not the man I uh, voted for or I got into that place one way or the other. Because the moment they enter that sort of, other forces come into it. And what are those forces? The forces are very clear. It's not only me that alluded to that. There have been so many people alluding to it. Um, I remember Professor Sylvester Dion, Ruben Abati, and so many other people um, based on their own experience. Um, you have the first problem, which is the overwhelming power um, of the president of Nigeria you tend to have a feel that probably you are the most powerful um, president on earth, and that could be very overwhelming. There's not many people that can manage that or handle that. Uh, in some cases, um, it tends to, um, to alter their uh, personal construct psychology and their disposition to collective you know, psychology of their people. So consequently, what you see is that their personal psychology you know, gets inflated to the, to, to, to the point that it overwhelms the collective interest which uh, they were elected uh, to, to, um, to, 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 to deliver. When you look at, um, let me give you a good example, there cannot be any justification for Rome to be born in, you know, and for Nero to travel to uh, Cairo. Um, when you look at the crisis surrounding the issue of um, uh, currency swap, 
um, and the fact that the country where we were beginning to witness a breakdown of law and order before the gallant security officers managed to put things back in place, our president gave a speech and left the country and went to Ethiopia to attend the OAU conference. Whereas the vice president of the country could as well have achieved the same thing, um, which will not diminish either our contributions in uh, the meeting or diminish our status. So it shows a level of insensitivity, in my view, um, to the plight of the people. We now realize that we have a president whose personal construct psychology has overwhelmed the collective you know, goals and desires and well-being of the people. In my view, that's my interpretation. The second factor is when you get into ASOR, you are now going to be faced with different interests, competing interests, in a way that um, while you are trying to Graphic, you know, the gratify one interest, you have that, you know, negating another interest, which in some cases may even be your own personal interest. Let me give you a good example also with uh, Buari's administration. Buari came in with the agenda, you know, to build a stronger uh, united Nigeria, you know, uh, where everybody will feel safe within the country. So within that context um, of building, developing a unity, uh, the president, you know, tried to implement um, grazing reserves. No, sorry, um, open grazing, you know, and he was supporting open grazing. And that created some tension. Um, we have people moving into our country from different parts of West Africa, you know, and then it led to tension with the local communities in different areas, both south, west, south, east, um, the middle belt, and even in the north. So that created some problems, and that problems were not easily um, overcome. Till now, um, is still one of the underlying issues that will inform, you know, this election. On the part of those who um, are, who shares the president's viewpoint, and uh, they think that is there's a major stake which they need to guide against and make sure that whoever they becomes the president can protect their interests. On the other part, again, you have those who have been the victims saying that, look, we are not going to allow um, this to continue again. A particular extraction uh, created this problem, and therefore we won't allow it. Um, they gave it extraction interpretation for obvious reasons because um, of um, who the president is. So you have those devils between reality and when you get in, even when you intend to implement it, you then face some other problem. Look, there was a time in Nigeria when um, a particular former head of state, I think it's Ibrahim Babangida, wondered why Nigeria, you know, how Nigeria has been able to survive, you know, all the pressures when it was um, in power. So when we look at the situation, um, when people get into office, it's one thing, um, what they do while in office is another thing. It's conditioned by the Asso Rock um, um, devil, which is um, the overwhelming power in that of that very office, um, changing people's um, psychology and personality, and then the also the, the 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 power game between the extractions in Nigeria and how this is uh, uh, these games are negotiated by the leadership. Hmm. Interesting. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is absolutely. what is playing out right now. Okay, uh, Mr. Shopperton, uh, taking from what Mr. Shomi just said now, uh, we had uh, a Yaradua in the same Asurok, and he seemed to have succeeded somehow. At least he gained the confidence of the citizenry. Uh, I don't know whether because his life was cut short, that is how we can, why we can sing uh, his name as a hero, but is it is it the the will? Does it have to do more on what the makeup of the individual is, or do you believe, like Mr. Shomi said, that the powers that be within Asurok can make a president, even with the best of intentions, to become something we didn't know he could ever become uh, before he was made the president? Do you blame it on the individual presidents or you blame it more on the power tussle within the presidency? Well, I mean, uh, thanks for the question. This is it's an interesting, you know, this is almost a sociology kind of question, psychology and uh, sociology kind of question. And 
Uh, there are a lot of theories with regards to this. Um, I've actually come across one particular work, uh, research finding that actually suggested that um, this, the, the, the actual physiology of a human being changes when they come into public office. Um, a study was conducted and they found that a particular part of the brain that uh, processes uh, uh, logical reasoning and all of that um, was affected negatively by uh, in people that were holding public office. And the interesting part of that finding, unfortunately, I've forgotten the name of that work right now. The interesting part of it is that when those people left office, their brains returned to normal. <laughs> you know, so um, uh, I, I, I have sort of held on to the idea that, uh, of course, when you do, when you get for public office, especially political, elected public office, um, there is a very, very strong tendency that your, your behavioral patterns that you are used to as a person will tend to be affected because you are contending with more than you ever have, especially for a country as complicated and complex and large as Nigeria. Um, speaking specifically about maybe the presidency of um, President Yaradua, uh, I, I hold a, 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 a different opinion. I don't know if it's an unpopular opinion, but I've never really considered that administration as being a great administration or being or considered uh, Yaradua, may so rest in peace, uh, as being a hero. I, I don't think we have enough evidence on the table to make those assertions. Uh, I think that he did not stay long enough, and indeed, um, even before he unfortunately passed, most of the time that he spent in office was spent taking care, attending to his health. So we never really saw a Yaradua presidency in Nigeria. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that was just a blank period in our history. The only thing that I remember him for, and that I think he must be commended for, is his continued insistence in the in those early days of his presidency on the rule of law, on, on being a servant leader. He was the one that coined that that introduced that that phrase more or less into our modern political uh, lexicon in Nigeria. You know, he was very particular about being a servant of the people, and he was very particular about ensuring that an atmosphere um, that where the respect for the rule of law is an atmosphere that he was determined to, to, to institute in the country. Um, and that was evidenced by the fact that he acknowledged immediately that the elections that, that, that produced him were flawed. And then he started the process that led to where we are today. That will always be his legacy. But beyond that, I, I don't really see you know, anything uh, particularly spectacular that happened in that period. Um, still talking about holding um, our political uh, candidates or, you know, office holders to account, especially on the basis of their manifestos. I think one of the things that I've also observed, um, and this will tie into how they behave uh, when they do get into office, it's very, very clear, uh, as has been earlier said, that none of them really intend, uh, I don't think they put out those manifestos with the intention of um, implementing them, because if they did, one of the evidences that you would have, for example, is that they would be more um, deliberate about putting the message out. And I, I had cause to say, to suggest on air, uh, one, one on, on other platforms, why, for example, do we not have the manifestos distilled into, for example, say flyers, one page or two page flyers, maybe a, maybe a fold over flyer that, that, that puts clearly the key points of those manifestos and how they intend to achieve them in those small documents that they then distribute all over the country, translated into different languages. You know, if they really intend, if they believe that the manifestos would have an impact and an influence on, on the outcome of the elections and that it would have an impact and an influence on how they govern the country, then they would have been more del deliberate about putting the message in the manifesto out there. While I was preparing for this program, here and go. I, 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 I decided to conduct an experiment. Of course, I have the documents with me by virtue of what I do, but I decided to assume the role of an average Nigerian and went online to look for these manifestos, and you will not believe how difficult it, it was. Um, I was eventually, I found the one for the Labour Party relatively easily. I just went, because, you know, as a, as, as a, as a member of the public, all I should do is go to the party website, mm. and it should be there. I found the one for the Labour Party with relative ease. The one for the APC, I eventually found. 
what I found, for example, was that there were several, several websites for the APC, and eventually I found there was one that had the next level manifesto. It's still there online as I speak, and on a different website. And I eventually found another website, which apparently is the, now the official website of the APC, and I was able to download that manifesto. As I'm speaking with you, I'm still searching for the one for the PDP, you know, um, and I haven't even attempted the one for the NNPP. What am I saying? These documents should be easily, readily available. In fact, I shouldn't need to look for them. They should be in my face as, as, as a voter because the, the political parties and their candidates are putting those things out as the promises they're making to us. But unfortunately, that is not the case. So therefore, when they get into office, because they know very clearly that their election was not necessarily based on any of these promises, like one of my colleagues on this panel has said before, when you go to the rallies, do they really make any significant effort to put in out clear, actionable plans and promises to the people? No. Most of the time, they abuse their opposition, they dance, abuse, abuse the opposition a bit more, say one or two things about what they will do, and, and the rally is over. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is unfortunately the cycle of our electioneering in Nigeria. You know, and as long as that continues, you continue to have a situation where people then get into office and then they start blaming demons. You know, I, I mean, I, I, the, the point that uh, Mr. Shomir referred to, I remember that article that uh, Dr. Ruben Abati put out about, and look, he wasn't joking. He was saying that there were demons in Asso Rock that were preventing candidates from performing. And I found that very laughable, you know, because you, you can't come to the public space and begin to blame spiritual forces for your governance failures, you know, it's, it's a bit of an insult to the sensibilities and, 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 um, and, and the intelligence of Nigerians. I think that what happens is that our politicians know that they do not owe their um, office, they do not owe their presence in the public space to the public, and therefore they don't really feel that they must uh, be beholden to them and they must, you know, fulfill any promises. So they continue to fulfill the promises they make to the interests that produce them. You know, it's, it's one of the biggest problems we have. You know, so, so you have the, a contending forces of interest fighting for policy actualization rather than the public good and the interest of, of, of the average Nigerian. And, and I think this is the problem. So for me, until we fix this issue of being able to hold uh, political uh, contestants accountable to promises that they make, it's going to be difficult to have them behave the way we expect them to behave when they get into office and for them to deliver good, 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 good governance. Okay. Uh, Mr. Shokotan has just uh, given us, uh, I'm coming to you, uh, Inshallah. Mr. Shokotan has just given us an uh, action plan, you know. It's like the, the politicians know what they're doing. The politicians are answering to other powers rather than the people. So it seems as if the ball is in our own court. Uh, to, to play it will be our choice, and to play it well will be a, even a, a greater choice. What can we do in your, in your thinking, uh, Shola, uh, to make sure that we hold these people whom we have elected accountable to us? Because in these their documents, I was expecting that there will be some kind of, uh, like Mr. Shopaton said, the Yaradu administration was... Uh, was particular about the obeying the rule of law. I was expecting that there will be something, some kind of channel of feedback, some kind of thing that will make the people know that if the, the, the people who are at the helm of affairs are going wrong, there's a way that the people can hold them accountable and say X, Y, Z, uh, that they will be open to the people. But they're just telling us we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And as the other people have said, there's no timeline, there's no time frame, there's nothing uh, to hold them and say, okay, at this time, like my people say, a dog that will be a hunting dog, you will know when it is still a puppy. Okay, so what do you think the people, the citizenry can do to hold these people accountable, as brief as you can be, please, Shola. Well, what we can do to make political decisions accountable is making performance the only or major criteria for winning elections. If you have not held any political office before, your antecedents, how you lived your life, your personal philosophy, your values, your vision, your scope should be the criteria for winning election. 
You should be able to trace you back to the root. You should be able to trace what you've done with your life. You should be able to trace how you solve problems, how you impact to the society. Then we making that the criteria for winning elections will better the quality step. And if you've held any political office before, we should be able to go back and examine your performance. When I say your performance, I mean realistic examination of how you really perform the government. You are awarded the road contract when you are in office. How much did you award the road contract? How much is the road contract in countries with similar climate, similar temperature, similar circumstance? How much are they awarding their road contract? What is the value of the road contract itself? I think those are the kind of things that we should be looking at. We should be looking at the performance of each candidate deeply. If you have been a legislator, what is your performance in the um, National Assembly? Because if you are there and all you do is sleep, and most of the people that even want to vote for you don't even know the function of the legislature itself, and you've not raised any motion, you've not supported any motion, you've not participated in any debate, and even look, look at the floor of the National Assembly sometimes, the streets are virtually empty. These same people will go back. And some of them will win the election. So not until we make performance, the criteria for winning the election, where politicians know that the criteria for winning the election is performance, definitely they will go all out there to perform because they want to win the election. But if there are opportunities for them to cut corners, if there are opportunities for them to buy votes, if there are opportunities for them to use force, to influence the security agencies, the opportunities for them to just use one um, one kind of um, to, to to just should I say mago mago or something? They would rather go for that. And I've said it on other platforms before. The Nigerian politicians are like a student, and I can tell you for free as one with a PhD in political science that some of our students, if you don't owe them well, if you don't claim that owe them accountable, they are not ready to read anything. So if politicians exist in a quality whereby they can easily have their way without performance, just like the students who have in our various institutions who are not ready to read. Politicians are also not ready to perform. They, they, they like to have their way. If I can touch on the question that you asked the other side, what limits like the um, performance of some of these politicians? They will Please round up. Please the... round up. Yes. Round up. Just round up. Okay. Um, I think we should just have a society where performance can win um, elections and we should have strong, credible institutions in such a way that you can't cut corners. There's no way you can buy vote. There's nobody you can interest at either. The security agencies are um, able to do their jobs. The political talks are not having a few days. I think that will improve our electoral system and overall the performance itself, power should return to the people, the mm. people that, the, the, the ordinary people that, that makes up the majority of the population, and this population should be well-oriented, should be well-educated to know what it means to elect somebody into okay. office and to educate them against some um, issues such as vote buying, okay. um of political participation and all that. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank you. I wish we had more time, but there's no time, gentlemen. Uh, we've had Biodun Shoomi, a public affairs analyst, Mr. Shegun Shokoton, Chairman Accountability, Kanda and Transparency Network, or Moshala DG, political scientist. I know that, gentlemen, when it comes to Saturday, maybe some of you will not be at your polling centers because you will be monitoring elections here and there, but I do hope that Saturday will come and go peacefully and that we are going to have uh, uh, a leader after our own heart and after the heart of God himself. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming on the program today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a break for the news, and when we return, we just conclude the run-up. Stay with us.